everyone. Okay, our study is from the pastoral epistles. We'll do all the introductory things that we did last week, talking about the pastoral epistles. Uh, but they are full of things that not only were helpful for the instructions given to Timothy and Titus by the Apostle Paul in the first century, they are uh, very helpful for us in the 21st century as well. Very practical words for us. Uh, they're, again, they're called pastoral epistles because they are instructions given to help for the care and guidance of congregations and important messages to Timothy and Titus about the things that they would need to do to set things in order, as he said to Titus in, in chapter one. We call the, set of the book, uh, The Study Trustworthy Sayings. Uh, as we said last week, not all of the lessons in, in the workbook are based on a passage that has that phrase, trustworthy <laughs> sayings. Uh, last week's did, and I uh, call that the ultimate trustworthy saying, nine words that changed the world forever. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And what that meant to the Apostle Paul, who was keenly aware of his past and the damage that he had done to the cause of the Lord and how thankful he was for the mercy that was extended to him. And we talked about the fact that the reasoning that Paul uses is the same reasoning that we can use, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save me. And that is, I don't know how you can get any more powerful than that. Lesson two today is what we call God-breathed writings. And the, uh, the primary text is from 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17 which reads, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. Now, your version may use some different words in that, your, your uh, translation, but we want to look at that about what it means that all scripture is breathed out by God or is given by inspiration of God. And what that means, maybe look a little bit about what it does not mean and uh, make some application to ourselves today. As I said last <coughs> week in the introduction to the study, uh, we're gonna be talking a good bit from time to time about text and context. Okay. And we won't get into uh, an in-depth discussion right now, but if you're not familiar with the difference between text and context, do some studying on that because it's, it's very important, especially in some of these lessons where we're looking at uh, lessons three and four that we'll cover next week and the week following. For we'll be talking about context a lot. And so make sure that you're familiar with that. And speaking of context, let's look at the context for this uh, text from 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17. So let's go back up for the context to about verse 10. Uh, and Ben, I'm going to ask if you would uh, begin with verse 10 and read down through verse 17 so we can get the context. Chapter 3, starting in verse 10? Yes. Now you followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions, and sufferings, such as happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. But evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings, which are able to give you wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Jesus Christ. All scripture is inspired by God and prophets. 
responsible for teaching or reproof or correction or training in righteousness so that the man of God may be adequate and equipped for every good work. Okay. Paul's telling Timothy there's some people that are not going to be doing things out of proper motives, doing some things that would, would uh, take away from uh, what he's trying to accomplish. He said, but as for you, and he gives some uh, uh, instructions, and he, he says, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred scriptures, What does that remind you of uh, from another passage earlier in 2 Timothy, from whom you learned it? Okay. Now, Timothy's mother and grandmother. As a matter of fact, uh, in this verse, um, verse 14, from whom you learned it, the, the Greek uh, for whom is plural there. Some people say, well, he, uh, Paul's referring to himself. Remember, you learned this all from me. I don't, I don't think that's what he said. I think he's referring back to what he had said earlier in chapter 1 of 2 Timothy. Talks about first um, from your grandmother and then your mother, and I'm convinced in you as well. And you learned these things. Now, certainly he learned some things from Paul, but a, a good lesson for us, I think, immediately we can see is how important it is for us to impart to our children and our grandchildren things about the sacred writings. Yes, well then. I like the idea here of all scripture. Mm -hmm. and I heard someone say or a lesson that that means from Genesis to Malachi. So because he says, I have known the Holy Spirit. He's known more than just what Paul has had with you. That's he, right. He knows God's word from the beginning to the end. That's right. So right. That's an encouragement for us to That's enjoy right. the Old Testament. And, and actually, we're going to have a question about that here in just a minute. Uh, so. Sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> hey, hey. I, I appreciate these segues that we have into uh, the things. But, but you're exactly right. He's not talking about just the things that I've talked to you about. Uh, it's going to go back way back further than that. All right, let's look at question number one. Could, could I ask a question? Yes. I guess it's kind of a follow-up. Uh, you, you you've got 20 seconds to ask a question. <laughs> kind of a follow-up to what we just heard. I don't mean to that different. The letter was written to Timothy. Timothy, we know, was schooled in the Old Testament. If you um, at this particular time that he was writing this, you know, my memory doesn't tell me how many books of the New Testament or letters in the Old Testament had been written at that point in time about which Timothy might be aware? Is there an answer to that question? Were they all written at this time? The Old, Old Testament was complete. For well, sure. But, uh, <laughs> the, the, the New Testament, uh, the, the, the quick answer is that most of the New, New Testament probably had not been written down. Uh, there are a few books probably that have been uh, written, uh, some of the early epistles. Uh, most people think that Galatians was one of the very earliest of the epistles. Uh, and it's really, um, we, we could debate forever about which ones may or may not have actually been written. But, but this is going to be another segue. We're going to talk about that again here in just a minute. So my question is really aimed at, is he talking about Old Testament scripture or all scripture? Well, we know today. Uh, wait, when we get to question five, we'll answer that. Okay. Because <laughs> uh, question five specifically addresses that here in just a minute. Yes, sir. I have a timeline, you know, it was put together by man, but Second uh, Timothy, okay approximately A.D. 67. Preceding it would be James, Galatians, Matthew, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st Corinthians, Romans, 1st Timothy, Jude, Ephesians, Philemon, Colossians, Philippians, Acts, 
First Peter, Hebrews, Luke, Second Timothy, Second Peter, four, Second Timothy. The and the majority and, of the New Testament. Well, that may or may not be accurate. I mean, that, that's it, 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 as I said, it's put together by man. But yeah, uh, no doubt, uh, some of the New Testament had already been uh, written and uh, dispersed uh, uh, among the disciples uh, to various parts of the world. Uh, there's no question that, that uh, some of them had. I think what we're going to see here, though, in, within the context is he's reminding him, well, let, 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 we'll get to that here as, as we go along. Um, what other term or phrase is used within the context that, that Ben read for us just a minute ago of this passage that helps define what scripture is? What's, what's the term? Matthew, the verse of course, is sacred writings. But it also kind of says sacred writings lead to salvation, which I, I think is a nice modification. Right. Uh, yes, it's useful. That's right. Uh, by scripture, we're talking about the sacred writings, uh, things that were written down. Uh, it comes from Greek and then in uh, Latin roots, which means just writings. Uh, but we're talking about the sacred writings. We're not talking about uh, poetry that a third grader might write uh, or, or uh, a newspaper a story written down or something like that. We're talking about the sacred writings. And that's what he says within the context. Uh, he says, um, but from childhood, you've been acquainted with the sacred writings. Now, uh, we'll get back again to uh, what this is, probably has reference to. But let's delve into... Uh, question two, because that, that starts getting into the meat of this, uh, where I want to spend the majority of time. Give your own brief definition for what is meant by inspiration within this context. And we know it means God breathes because of some of the other translations, but let's go beyond that. Yes, sir. Uh, the directing of the writer's mind to communicate the thoughts of God. Okay. The directing of the writer's mind to communicate the thoughts of God. Um, one of the reasons why some of the um, newer translations, instead of using the word inspiration, use God breathe, is because God breathe is a literal translation of that. That's, that's what the Greek word uh, means. It means a breathing out by God. Uh, Coming, coming, coming from God's breath. We'll talk a little bit about uh, what that means and what it maybe does not mean. Uh, inspiration, we use the term inspiration today in a different way than it would have been used uh, in the 1600s when the King James uh, translation uh, was formed. Uh, we talk about inspiration, oh, oh you are my inspiration. You are what keeps me trying harder, and you inspire me to do bigger and better things. That's not what that inspiration there is referring to. So it's probably easier for us to stay on track when we think of it as being God-breathed. Uh, someone else? Uh, yes, Maybe Ronnie? I'd like to read a scripture definition of what inspiration is. Okay. Found in the Old Testament. In the 36th chapter of Jeremiah, we see it actually happening. Now it came to pass in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Take a scroll of a book and write on it all the words that I have spoken to you against Israel. That's inspiration. Okay. I think that's exactly right. I don't think I know that's exactly right. And going along with that, uh, someone uh, read to us from the book of 2 Peter, chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. Whoever gets that, 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were moved along by the Holy Spirit. 
okay? And which goes along with what Ronnie was just reading. Uh, the, the prophets of old didn't just, didn't just say, you know what? I think I'm going to write some things down and I'm going to predict what's going to happen one of these days. That's, Peter's clearly saying that's not what happened. Uh, and as Ronnie read from Jeremiah, uh, these, these people were moved along or carried along by the Holy Spirit bringing a message directly from God. It wasn't something that they thought of themselves, and that's what Peter is emphasizing. This is not something that someone came up and said, I, I think this is the way it's going to be. Yes, sir. Uh, there's another scripture, Matthew 10, 19. It says, but when they deliver you up, take no thought of how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given to you in the same hour what ye shall speak. Right. Uh, and there, there's several passages where uh, Jesus is telling his apostles specifically that, uh, for, exa for example, he says, the Spirit will guide them into all truth. And as, as that verse there uh, said, you don't have to worry about what you're going to say. The Holy Spirit will give you in that hour what you need to say. Now, uh, there's, there's two different uh, things here, not necessarily different things, but uh, one is what the apostles would say when they got up to speak, like, for example, on the day of Pentecost uh, or other times that they would speak, and the things that they would write down, in, in, whether it was in the Old Testament, or the prophets bringing a message from God, or whether it's in the New Testament uh, speaking uh, the good news about Jesus Christ and what his will was for us. We're primarily here talking about the sacred writings, the scripture. It's God breathed. Now, the $64,000 question is, how does God breathe? And then we have this. How does that process take place? Uh, what happens when God breathes? <coughs> I, I get several different answers. Joe? I was thinking 1 Thessalonians 1, 4 and 5. Okay. And then, but we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that the creation waited in patience for the revelation of the Son of God. Okay. Um, not just with words. Okay. Uh, does God breathe? <laughs> Literally, does God breathe? Shake your head this way. There you go. This this guy. He, he's getting on. He gives life. Why, why do you say that, Jerry? Okay. Both of those are correct. Genesis says he breathed into his nostril, nostrils the breath of life. The man became a living soul. Um, Je Jesus breathed on his apostles to receive the Holy Spirit. Uh, now, I don't want to get too bogged down in this because lessons three and four are going to be talking in depth about handling rightly the word of truth and about, um, as a matter of fact, the last question in today's lesson is talking about whether things are always literally true. We're going to talk about that in depth in lessons three and four. Does God have a literal physical body that can breathe Respiration, in and out. <coughs> the answer to that is no. Clearly, we shouldn't be. No, he does not. God is spirit. God is not flesh. Uh, so when it says all scripture is God breathed or breathed out by God, that obviously has to be interpreted some way. If God doesn't literally breathe. Now, And it comes, I mean, isn't that basically the same thing as God speaking? Obviously, God spoke to somebody, whether it was through the vision 
or this is what you spoke to them, and isn't that in reference to what God did to them? I think that it is. Uh, not all scripture, though, is coming uh, as uh, a voice from heaven. Uh, now, um, I'll get back to you in just a second. <laughs> let, let me say this. Um, one of the main reasons why I wrote this is to challenge me and to challenge each one of us to do some real big time studying about this instead of just glossing over something and say, well, all scripture is God breathed. Okay, I understand that. Well, do you really understand what that means? Uh, does, does any of us completely understand uh, what all uh, is involved with that? You have some scripture, as Ronnie said, that is a message directly from God, a prophecy, for example. Second Peter, the Second Peter scripture that we just talked about is passage from Jeremiah. The word of the Lord came to, the word of the Lord came to, and bringing a prophetic message. Uh, there's some, just one second. There's some scripture that's a narrative about Abraham uh, went and sojourned somewhere, whatever. There's some that are epistles, that are letters to someone. Uh, and for example, Paul might tell Timothy, when you come, bring the cloak that I left at Troas and the books and the parchments. Uh, other passages of scripture, like in the Psalms, are uh, Psalm penit uh, penitent or penitentiary Psalms, where David said, to the Lord in, in uh, Psalm 51, against you and you only have I sinned. Some of them are what are called imprecatory psalms, where he calls down curses on the enemies of God. Those are, the, and I, those are uh, under this heading, I believe, I'm convinced, of all scripture that he talks about in 1, 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. Those are all scripture but they're very different kinds of scripture. And so are they all breathed out by God? Well, this verse says that they are. Either they're, they are or they're not. I think most of us here, if not all of us, believe, yes, they are breathed out by God. How does that all, all happen? Okay, and that's going to get us back to what Jerry said earlier about God breathes life into things. When God, uh, when God breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life, he wasn't doing CPR as a human would do. God, uh, God's was the source of the life that came into Adam. Um, we don't have time to look at them in depth. Um, write down, if you would, Job 34, 14 to 15, for your own study. Job 34, 14 to 15. This talks about the breath of God. And in the context there, he's saying basically, uh, if, God, if God withheld his breath, everyone would die. Which is an interesting concept. If God withheld his breath, we would all perish. We would, we'd all die. So it's God's breath that not only forms life as, as an atom, but it also, according to that passage, sustains life. And by analogy, what I would say is God's breath not only formed scripture, it sustains scripture. And what, I'm, what do I mean by that? It sustains scripture. How do we know that what we have right here <clears throat> is all scripture. Maybe there's some more out that we're supposed to have. Well, uh, that's our belief in the providence and faith of God. Right. That, that he superintends this whole process. He oversees it. He sustains it through his breath, not physical breath, but, but his ultimate power, 
could not only get this scripture composed, uh, it's, it's distributed, it's revealed, and it's sustained. So that what we have here by faith, as Ronnie says, we, and, and, and uh, God and his ability to give life, that we can by faith know that this is God's will for us completely. Because look at, look at the last part of the text. All scriptures breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. We're going to get, get uh, that, that's actually, might as well go ahead and say that. That's question number three. I'm going and answering question three. It's profitable for those things. Well, how do we know it's profitable for teaching? Because we have faith that, that God's breath provided something for us and it, it sustains it, it keeps it going. Uh, for reproof, that's convincing and convicting. Convincing that, or proving that this is what it claims to be. For correction, for getting, getting us back on the right track and for training in righteousness. That the man of God may be, be competent, some, be, some versions say perfect or complete, equipped for every good work. What are, the, what are the good works that we can do that are not found here? They're not. This furnishes us to every good work through the God breathing. Now, he, what does Hebrews 4.12 say about um, that will have to do with this God breathing? Some of you scholars. The word of God is what? Quick, right, the King James says quick. What do the new versions say? Alive or living. That, that's the, the old version of uh, many of quick means something that's alive. God breathed and then we have a living word that's able to do the things that it talks about here. Now, Wayne had something and then Bill. Just kind of going way back to where I believe Jerry said scripture, God breathes means it gives life. And we you've been talking about that for the last two minutes, I guess, but giving life means giving it value, making it something that is profitable, something that we ought to be doing, we ought to be paying attention to it, and on and on and on. Uh, that's what God breathes means to me. Gives it right. life and right. it place. And how all that happens uh, and, the, and how it manifests itself, uh, I don't know that anyone completely knows exactly, although I do know how it manifests itself in the, in the written living word uh, that's able to do the, the things that uh, it, it's talked about here in the passage. Bill. Well, I, I just want to say, David, that I'm glad that somebody brought up this idea of life. Because in a sense, uh, our breath is the source of our life. And we are probably going to touch on this a little bit later in the lesson down to question seven. But uh, in John 6, there are many interesting subjects that Jesus is dealing with with his disciples. And one of them is a very clear statement that he made. The word that I have spoken to you, they are spirit and they are life. That's right. So they would never, never forget that. That's right. It's always connected with life. It is connected with life, and God is the source of all of that. And as the passage in Job that I referred uh, y'all to earlier says, if God were to take his breath away, the life would stop. That's what, sus what began it and what sustains it. Um, here's what I. Here's what I in my feeble way, put down um, for what is meant by inspiration within the context. Uh, talking about some God breathed, scripture was composed and revealed and preserved by God himself, a process which is represented by breathing on someone and thus imparting life represented by God breathing. Now that doesn't have to be literal, but we can understand it 
That, that, that's a life-giving process that gives the scriptures life and makes Hebrews 4.12 correct. The word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And as the passage here says, what it's profitable for, for all these various things. Let's go to the next question. Titus 1-2 is one of the uh, pastoral epistles references. Uh, what phrase in that gives us assurance about scripture since it is, since it is God breathed? Go ahead, one lady. He does not lie. So what's the connection? What, what does that have to do with what we're talking about here? True. It's absolutely dependable, always true. God cannot lie. It's not like God rarely lies or God infrequently. He never lies. And if God has a cannot, cannot, that's right. His nature is such. Um, it's just like we talk about God being a just God. He can't be a just God and do certain things. <clears throat> Because it's his nature. And that's a story for another time. A lesson for another time. But he cannot lie. So when God breathes out scripture, we know that it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. We know that. We don't have to suppose. It's absolutely dependable. And that's something that the modernists today that want to take some of scripture and discard other parts of scripture, they don't follow that concept. It's either, it's either completely true, every single word, without error, and we'll talk about that in a minute, or it's just a bunch of fairy tales. You can't have it both ways. Okay. Question five, uh, I, I told you we would get to this in a minute. The term scripture within the primary text is probably mostly a reference to Old Testament scripture. Why? Mostly what they had because he says, you learn these things from a childhood, from your childhood, uh, Timothy. So going back several years, yes, it is, as, as we talked earlier, Probably some of the New Testament epistles uh, and maybe even a, a gospel account uh, may have been written down at this time. But he, he goes back to Timothy's childhood. Some years ago, he said, you've known these sacred writings. Now, however, even if, it, even if that's exclusively talking about the Old Testament, and as Wilayne said earlier, from Genesis to Malachi, that scripture, um, say, however, 1 Timothy 5, 18 and 2 Peter 3, 15 to 16 give evidence that New Testament passages are also referred to as scripture. How would you arrive at that conclusion? Peter, Paul, were accepted as the rest of scripture. So, yeah. includes in that group that has to be. That's right. That's what 2 Peter 3, 15 to 16 says. Peter in that context says some of Paul's writings are hard to understand. And some people twist them to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures or the rest of scripture. So just by understanding the meaning of those words, that clearly says that what Paul was writ was, had written was scripture and would be included under this all scripture. And then 1 Timothy 5, 18 says, it's talking about what? Scripture. Scripture. <laughs> Specifically, when he says the laborer deserves his wages, he says the ox, uh, you don't muzzle the ox that treads out the corn, and the laborer deserves his wages. Yes. You know, what I think is interesting, and it's important text, 1 Timothy 5, 18, which says, for Scripture says, you should not muzzle the ox while it treads out the grain. That's in Deuteronomy 25, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. That's Luke uh, uh, 10. So we've got both the Old Testament and the New Testament 
being called scripture. Thank you. That's exactly uh, the point that I'm trying to make by pointing that out. You've got one that thou shalt not muzzle the ox. That's uh, clearly from the Old Testament. That's labeled as scripture. But the laborer is worthy of his wages. Is not found in the Old Testament anywhere. Jesus said that in Luke 10. Um, and so uh, it's got both the Old and the New Testament referred to as scripture. Okay, let's look at number, question number six here, just very briefly. Uh, this is something that you have to really ponder for a while, I think, to get the full import. We believe and teach that the Bible is inspired by God, but why is it very important that Scripture makes this specific claim about itself? In my little hint here, how would things be different if the claim was not made or if we did not believe this claim to be true? All right, so how would it be different if the claim was not made? There would be no claim at all. Uh, that's right. People, would, people that, are, that uh, do not believe in uh, Scripture being God-breathed would say, well, yes, it's got many good things, but even Scripture itself never claimed that it was coming from God. But yes, it did. It's, it's critical that the Scripture makes that claim about itself. And so, uh, you know, some people say, well, yeah, he said a lot of things, but he didn't claim that it was actually this. Well, yes, the scripture actually does claim that. And of course, if we didn't, the B part of that is if we don't believe it to be true, uh, then we just need, need to work on our own faith. And that goes back to what we said earlier. Uh, it's all taken by faith. We have to believe it to be true. And it makes the claim about itself. Uh, and that's that's an important point. Yes, sir. Well, what is scripture? It is God speaking to us. And when this statement is made, it's God saying, believe what I'm saying. That's, what, that's right. Yeah. It, it, is, it is a God-breathed message. That give, that God gives it life. And that's why the word of God is living. Uh, and it's profitable for all of these things. Verbal inspiration. What is that? That's question, question number seven. The word of themselves communicated from God. Okay. As opposed to what? Okay. Thoughts or ideas. When uh, Ronnie was reading from Jeremiah earlier, did God go to Jeremiah and say, okay, Jeremiah, I've got this concept here about a Messiah coming. And I want you to, to write some things about that. The, 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 the concept of a Messiah <coughs> No, he gave him words to speak regarding that. And we're going to be talking about that as we get into rightly dividing the word of truth, a basic principles of Bible study, next week in lesson three, and then following in lesson four, we're going to delve pretty deeply into this. We're going to talk about inerrancy of scripture that we didn't get to talk about this morning. What do we mean by inerrancy? Uh, some people don't understand. And the note that I have at the bottom let me just read that and we'll be done. Some people reject the idea of the Bible's inerrancy. They believe they can point out errors in scripture, but often it is because they misunderstand what an error actually is. A critical point to understand and remember is that a passage of scripture does not contain an error simply because it may not be literally true. So for next week, let your mind expand some and, and let's talk some about literal versus figurative and the things that are involved with that. And is something an error just because it may not be literally true? Yes, you can use, you can use any book. Thank you all.